Welcome to the workshop, CAR T cell therapy, multiple myeloma. My name is Lynn Spina, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gunjan Shah. Dr. Shah joined Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in 2016 and is part of the adult BMT service and the cellular therapy services. Her research has focused on improving access, tolerability, and outcomes for patients with lymphoma and myeloma undergoing autologous and allogeneic stem cell transplant and CAR T cell therapy. Dr. Shaw is also interested in the comparative and cost effectiveness of treatments for the hematologic malignancies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shaw. Thank you uh, for inviting me, and uh, I'm you know, happy to give this talk and happy to answer any questions uh, at the end. My disclosure. Um, so the overall, what we're going to go through is that there are two commercially available, meaning FDA-approved uh, CAR T-cell products for multiple myeloma. Um, the timing of this therapy depends on treatments that you people have had beforehand and the approvals um, by the FDA. Um, there are, are two main side effects that are different uh, than side effects we think about with transplants. Uh, one is called cytokine release syndrome, and the other is immune effector cell neurotoxicity, uh, otherwise known as ICANS. Uh, but there are also a few other uh, side effects and complications um, that are important. Um, and overall, that there are many options uh, for therapy with multiple myeloma. So overall, what I want to go through today and, and think about is in the bigger spectrum of not just the care of we do a treatment and you know do you get into remission how long does it last for but there's a whole spectrum of when we look at whether a new treatment um, is helpful worth it you know beneficial and and part of that is it you know falls under this umbrella of value-based care and so there's of course the clinical outcomes that we think about in terms of responses and survival um, there's also the quality of life side of this of, you know, can, even if it's the best treatment ever, if nobody can get it, you know, how is that helpful? If there's so many side effects, um, you know, are we, are we really doing patients um, any help by giving them this treatment? Um, and is it different between different populations in terms of, you know, responses, things we need to think about? There's also the healthcare system side of, you know, can we physically, in the buildings and support systems and everything that we have, accommodate this new therapy, whether it's we need, you know, X number of chairs to, um, you know, actually collect the cells for this process? Is there enough, um, you know, places to actually give the cells back? Um, and, you know, then there's also the cost part of this, of, you know, how much is the insurance covering, how much of it is being transferred back to the patient in terms of out-of-pocket costs, how long are you out of work for, um, and so all of this together sort of plays into the system of how we actually think about new treatment. And so for multiple myeloma, we've been very fortunate over the last sort of six decades um, that the landscape of treatment options has become uh, very broad, and I, you know, give this example of if, you know, people that have seen the TV show um, called The Midwife, um, the first episode of the current season has a patient who has multiple myeloma, you know, in this, uh, the 50s and 60s, you know, where that show is set, and all they were able to do at that time was give people steroids and pain medications and keep them comfortable. And it's very interesting to sort of see when we're, you know, now at a place where we have so many more treatment options than that. Um, and, you know, through the 70s and 80s that we got, you know, more traditional chemotherapy, the availability to do transplants, and then really after 2000 is where all of these what we call sort of novel agents or newer, you know, therapy options, everything that you um, actually get now that you could think of, you know, really was developed uh, and, and approved after 2000. And so we 
you know, got treatments such as bortezomib and lenalidomide in the next generations of carfilzomib and pomalidomide, uh, daratumumab, sort of the newer monoclonal antibodies. And then we come to sort of the more recent approvals for the CAR T cells and hopefully soon to be approved, um, you know, the one is approved now and then, you know, more coming of the bispecific, um, you know, antibodies. And so we have made a lot of progress uh, over this time. So there's sort of a philosophy of treatment now in terms of thinking about uh, what order we use all of these different treatments in. And so some of it is, you know, how effective are they? How quick do they work? How likely are, is it going to work? And how long is it going to work for? Um, is this a one-time treatment? Is this sort of you're on indefinitely for while it's working? If we pick one option now, does it prevent you from getting the rest of the options in the future? And then all of these treatments obviously have their own risks um, and benefits that go with them. And, you know, are there short-term risks and long-term risks? And how do we balance, you know, when you do which and when it's worth, you know, taking the extra risk for the, for the benefit, uh, which could potentially be more or less. So the first thing I want to sort of think about is, you know, the two sort of newer treatments, um, the CAR T cell versus the bispecific uh, antibody or T cell engager. And so if you, the idea behind a CAR T cell is really that we're taking your immune cell, the T cell, which is there always in your body, which is normally there to fight off viral infections, get rid of cells that are abnormal, that shouldn't be there. And what was done was trying to figure out a way to sort of soup up your own immune system. And you can see here where we have this receptor on the plasma cell, this little green, you know, thing hanging off on, on the left side of, of the plasma cell in the center. And the idea is that we want to bring the T cell, whose job it is to normally kill off the cells that shouldn't be there, but how do we get it to on purposely come to that particular plasma cell? Um, and how do we get it to know that, hey, this is what we want you to kill. And so the way that that's done is this whole yellow piece here is added, which is the part that makes it the CAR, which is the chimeric antigen receptor. And so there's a binding area which is going to connect to the receptor on the cell itself. So you can think of it as sort of like we're putting a homing device on and these two pieces have to match so that it knows to pull this cell over here. And then in order to sort of make this cell then work and do its job, we have to um, have these extra activation and co-stimulatory domains. And the differences in these are where you get different side effects between the different products. It's also why potentially we may eventually say one works better than another one. Um, but this whole sort of yellow construct here is where we sort of call it the CAR T cell. That's what's getting added. On the other side of this, you'll see the bispecific T cell engager. And in this, um, we still want the T cell to do its job, but here what we're actually giving a patient is this sort of orange, uh, you know, red sort of area where the drug itself binds to both. It binds to the T cell and it binds to the plasma cell through that receptor. And so the, the drug actually has sort of two things, which is why it's called bispecific, and it binds on both sides. And so the same idea that you're bringing that T cell to kill the plasma cell um, but this time it's a drug that's connecting the two uh, to each other. So how do you actually get a CAR T cell? So what happens is a, the patient is connected to a leukapheresis machine, which is basically a machine that looks like a dialysis machine. So the blood comes out one side, we take the cells that we want, and the rest of the blood goes back into the body. Those T cells that we've taken out are sent either to a company for an approved product or to whatever lab for the investigational products. And they add, as we said, that yellow sort of uh, protein to the outside. And then they grow it up and expand it and make many, many, many of them. And then they freeze it and they send it back uh, to us. Once it comes back, uh, we give what we call lymphodepleting chemotherapy, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but the idea behind that is it's mostly the fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, uh, but the idea is that you're making space. So we kind of need to get rid of some of the current immune system so that there's space for these T cells to go and grow. So you get the chemotherapy for a few days, and then these cells are put in. And so the timeline and sort of how this works is that right now it takes 
between four to eight weeks or so for the cells to actually be made. So once it's decided that someone is going to get those cells, um, the apheresis part happens, so that's the taking out of the cells, and that production is happening. And in the meantime, we still have to do something to control the myeloma for that six weeks or so until the cells are ready, and that's what's called bridging chemotherapy. It can be radiation, it can be some combination of drugs someone hasn't had yet, um, but basically the idea is if it controls the myeloma, that's great. Um, if it gets us down to even really small amounts of myeloma, even better, but really just so that it's not growing while we're waiting. Then you have the three days of the lymphodepletion chemotherapy, and then on day zero you get your infusion. What then happens over the next couple uh, days is, you know, there is some of that killing related to the chemotherapy itself. So the blood counts are going to go down, and then the blood counts are going to start coming back up about two weeks later. During that time, the CAR T cells are growing um, and expanding. Um, we don't know exactly how long the CAR T cells last, um, but we know that it's usually at least uh, uh, that there's a time of expanding and then a time of, uh, of those cells going away. So the hope is that the longer that they last for, the more that they're sort of doing, but at least usually about a month or so. Um, there's the risk of the cytokine release syndrome and the neurologic toxicities, which we'll talk about, and then the risk of infections, which lasts longer um, as we sort of wait for that immune recovery to happen. You'll see that there's this later a uh, box that I have over here for the same color of the risk of the neurologic toxicity, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but there is a, a, a risk on the myeloma side um, of some side effects that have been seen um, at, at later time points than the, just the early neurologic toxicities. So some of these main side effects that we sort of think about beyond the blood counts going down and coming back up related to the chemotherapy um, can be the cytokine release syndrome, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later on, but can be things like fevers, your heart rate going up and down, your blood pressure going up and down, your oxygen level going up and down. The neurologic toxicity can be on a, a very mild level, word finding difficulties, trouble, uh, writing, getting tremors, um, and then on the more serious side can be seizures. Um, the other things that we can see, though, during all of this, we can see some nausea and vomiting, some diarrhea. These are primarily more related to the chemotherapy. Um, we can see more inflammatory things, so this can be some fluid that's building up, the liver numbers going up, the kidney function, you know, worsening, and these can be related to inflammatory changes that are happening as that the cells are attacking each other. Um, and then, of course, the infections, as we talked about, partly related to the blood counts being low and the overall immune system being low. So during all of this, because we sort of know that there are these risks, um, and we can tell, um, you know, which uh, infections uh, people are more likely to be at risk for, and there's sort of this acute time, which is usually during that first month when the blood cell counts are low. Primarily during that time, we're much more worried about bacterial infections and fungal infections, and so the um, you're on uh, prevention medicines for uh, those. As the white blood cell count recovers, your immune function can still be low, and that's when we worry more about uh, potentially respiratory viruses, um, uh, pneumocystis, another type of, um, you know, uh, infection that you can get when your immune system is low. And then later on, you know, tends to be more, again, pneumonias, upper respiratory infections, uh, and, and uh, depending on how long and how low the immune system is, can still be uh, shingles and, and other viral infections. So on this slide, you'll see all of the FDA-approved CAR T cells, many of which are for lymphoma and leukemia. Um, you'll see I've sort of added in red on here, you know, as we get more and more indications and more and more timelines, so that on the lymphoma side, it used to be that patients had to have already had uh, two lines of treatment, and this was available for the third line of treatment. We've also added other histologies, meaning other subtypes of lymphoma, um, from just the diffuse large B cell to follicular lymphoma, um, mantle cell lymphoma, um, and then the acute lymphoblastic uh, leukemia side, that there are products approved for that as well. On the myeloma side, the two products 
um, that we're going to spend more time talking about um, are the Ida captagene and the Silta um, captagene, so Ida cell and Silta cell as they're referred to in short. Um, currently, both of these require patients to have had at least four different treatments or four lines of therapy. Um, and so that's kind of where the biggest counting uh, happens right now for whether someone is eligible for treatment or not. So to look a little bit more closely uh, at these two, um, both of these are what we call autologous, meaning that they are made from your own cells. These are not made from donor cells. Um, as we were sort of thinking about in that original picture, which is sort of repeated down here, that there are these different uh, domains. So the binding domain here, um, uh, both of them are this anti-BCMA. This means that the protein that they are uh, being attached to on the, uh, or what they will connect to on the plasma cell is called BCMA. Um, there are other investigational CAR T cells that are looking at two or three different other targets, so other proteins that are on the outside of the myeloma cells that this could, uh, these CAR T cells could attach to. Um, in these ones, the, di the main difference in the co-stimulatory, uh, these domains, basically what these tell us is that there are certain side effect profiles that can go along with that. In, in the lymphoma side, the different products have different of these domains. In the myeloma side, these are actually both similar and that they've used um, similar um, domains so that they, they, the type of side effects you're going to have are not necessarily different. The big difference of the only real difference that we see here um, is that the SILTA cell uh, or CARVICTI has two BCMA targeting sites. So basically that it means that instead of there just being one area in that part that can connect to the plasma cell, there's actually two of them there. So in theory, potentially you can connect double and maybe kill it a little bit more. Um, as I said, both of these products require you to have had at least four lines of treatment prior. So what do we know so far um, in the clinical trials that have been done? And again, we actually can't compare these directly to each other because each of them comes from a separate clinical trial. And in each of these clinical trials, they had their own eligibility uh, criteria for patients um, that were included. So you can't really compare them to each other directly. Um, but basically, the idea here is, and so there are three columns that we have listed here, the Ida cell, the Silta cell, and then teclistimab is the bispecific uh, antibody. So what we know so far, and you can see that these are relatively short follow-up, so meaning that, you know, between a year and a year and a half of time that patients have been followed on the clinical trials, that this is what they saw. And you can see that across all of three, that there's, you know, 60 to 90% uh, where you will have some response to treatment, which is great. Um, there is uh, whether you have complete response uh, and the time frame for how long that takes to get to um, is a little bit different potentially. And again, this is where it's really hard because you automatically want to sort of be like, well, 80% looks better than the 30%, but they're different patients. What they got beforehand is a little bit different, and so it's not directly comparable in that way. Um, what we can sort of see is on, the patients that were on these clinical trials um, between one and two years, uh, at least at that time, um, that it was working for um, on average. So sort of that median number, so about half were above that, half were below that. Um, and the same for the progression-free survival, that the sort of median numbers of these were um, between nine months and about a little bit more than two years um, of, of how long that these uh, worked for. So now the other side that we sort of look at in this is the uh, side effects. And so when we look across all of these, you know, we separate these out into any amount that was complained about or seen on a clinical trial, which are the any grade, and sort of the more severe ones, which are the grade three and four. And you can see it, which is actually really great, that across all of these products, the cytokine release syndrome, um, which again is the fevers and heart rates up and down and the blood pressure's up and down. So that all of these products have a pretty good chance that you're going to have at least a fever in those early days. But that the chances that you're going to need to go to the intensive care unit for monitoring, that you're going to have to be on blood pressure support or breathing support um, are not very are not very high. 
and mostly they're controllable. So it's that we can start treating early enough that we can prevent it from getting more serious. You can see though that in the Adicel and the teclistimab, these happen sooner rather than later, you know, within a day or a couple days, and may last for four or five days. And this is why we talk about doing these treatments at least the first one of the ticlis, the first week um, dosing for the teclistimab and the Idacel, you know, where you get the infusion in the hospital and you're sort of watched for those first couple days because it's very likely to happen sooner. The Silta cell tends to be where the side effects happen, but they tend to happen a little bit later. And so if we automatically say someone needs to be in the hospital for the first seven days, but this doesn't start till seven days, then it's much more likely that you'd end up getting discharged from the hospital and then ending up having to come right back because you get a fever the next day. And so the point of this really to say that we have to really look at the timing of when these side effects happen so that we can plan accurately for when people need to be monitored more closely or not. The neurologic toxicity is kind of the same idea. These are much lower percentages um, than we see with the lymphoma CAR T cells, and so we have to have a different plan for monitoring and follow-up than we do for those products. And again, you can see that the high-grade ones, which is more where you're getting seizures, again, having to be monitored in the intensive care unit, are much lower, which is good. Um, there have been seen with all of the products of the CAR T cells, these ones and the investigational ones, this delayed neurotoxicity that can be seen. Um, it's very rare. There's only a few cases, um, you know, seen. Um, but there can be this Parkinson's-like sort of syndrome that happens um, even sort of two months or three months after the CAR T cells. And so there's a lot of work that's gone on to try to figure out why can we predict who would have those side effects. It's such a small number of people right now that it's very difficult to um, you know, know that or predict, and so all we can really do is watch out for it um, and, and treat, you know, if, if that happens. The other big side effect and the other thing that we sort of want to look at, as we talked about that's important, is these patient-reported outcomes. So this means that it's not when you go to the doctor's office and the doctor says, how do you feel, and you say, I'm nauseous, I'm tired. These are more where you directly get to answer how nauseous or how tired you are, and most of the time these are these are done through um, survey questionnaires, either on paper or through an electronic portal, where you're being tracked over time to sort of see, are you getting better, are you not getting better, should we do something inter intervening, but that you have much more control over how you're sort of saying that these exist. And um, these are, you know, two of the figures that are there from, uh, you know, one from each product's trials where they kept track on these fatigue scales of what people were answering. I think the biggest thing to sort of think about here is that um, over time, it does take, you know, because of the treatment that you're having, um, you, people tend to be more fatigued, um, especially in that first month. And then it sort of recovers towards baseline, but it can take a long time depending on what's going on, whether people relapse or don't relapse, and how long it's you know working for. Um, but I think incorporating these and allows patients to be sort of more involved in their care. Um, and so you'll see that these are you know more and more being done and reported and being asked of people, even not in a clinical trial, but just ways that we can incorporate these um, into into the standard practice. Um, so that we can best coordinate care um, depending on what's going on. So the, our, there are a lot of, um, you know, discussions that you will see of, uh, you know, how much do these treatments cost and is it worth it? Um, the cost comparisons that people have sort of done so far, um, you know, have really tried to compare different treatments with what's considered standard of the moment. And remember, the CAR T cells right now are approved for people who've had at least four lines of treatment, and so they've probably had many of the uh, approved therapies already. And so when you compare to like what you can potentially get if you've already had all of the approved treatments, um, that's where we really see a lot of the benefit because the CAR T cells work differently than all of the other treatments, that we really do see these differences. Now, the big thing with this, and you can see sort of in this intervention cost, is that automatically the CAR T cells cost at least $450,000 that are sort of built, um, you know, into uh, the product cost itself. And that's what, when we go to insurance 
practices and say, you know, we want to give our patient a CAR T cell, this is what the insurance company is sort of approving. We know that on top of that cost, there is the actual cost of the infusion, of the monitoring in the hospital, the monitoring through that first month. Um, and so all of that kind of gets incorporated into this total cost section. Um, and then there's a lot of assumptions in here of, you know, how well people did, how long they had to be in the hospital. But you can basically see that in these, you know, approximate calculations um, that, you know, it, it, it costs about um, per month of, of extra survival um, anywhere between twenty and thirty thousand uh, dollars per month. And so this is not to say that we shouldn't do this or everybody shouldn't do this or anything like that, but it's more just to take into account that we have to balance. Um, the whole system, and so what's the most appropriate in the order in which we do it tries to sort of maximize how likely we are things to work and how much we, um, in what order they, they're most likely to work in. And these are some of the factors, you know, that we look at. There are a lot of clinical trials ongoing um, th with the two approved products. So one of the big things to look at is, you know, can we use these treatments earlier? So why wait until people have had four or more lines of treatment already? Um, can, we, can we do this when they've only had um, two or three lines of treatment? Can we do this in the beginning and this is the first treatment that they get? Um, you know, do we do this instead of a transplant? Um, what happens if you've had a transplant and the myeloma is still there? Can we, you know, in people that are more high risk, can we can we use this as a way to prevent the myeloma from coming back? The other clinical trials that are ongoing are, um, you know, as we sort of talked about, the cytokine release syndrome and the neurologic toxicities are really what limits people, and it's really why we keep people out of work for a month. It's why we keep everybody close by for that first month. And so if you can prevent those from happening or you can treat them quicker, um, you know, can that get people to be able to go home sooner and not have to stay close by? Um, if we get all of this to work better, if we get all of those response rates up at 100%, 90%, you know, how do we make these better? And can we put more than one target, right? If we, if we instead of just the BCMA, can you have it be two different proteins um, that we're using at the same time so that you're more likely to attack the cells? Um, and can we get them from a donor uh, so that the there's some theories that w when you've had sort of four or more lines of treatment that the T cells that we get out to make into CAR T cells are already very tired. They've seen a lot of treatments. They've seen the myeloma for a lot of time. And so if you get a donor cell that's healthy, that's never seen any of these things, you know, can they be made into better CAR T cells that are going to last longer in the body, that are going to work more? But obviously then we have to sort of balance um, with uh, the the risks of using somebody else's cells that are not your own, um, and how do we do that without having the risks of graft versus host disease that we can sometimes have um, on the allogeneic transplant side? So the biggest concerns for the CAR T cell treatments are the insurance approval and timing. So as you know, it takes a little bit of time from when we decide that we want to give someone a CAR T cell to actually be able to get approval from the insurance company. And so if people need treatments in between because their myeloma is progressing very rapidly, you know, how do we do that? Um, right now, both of the commercially available products are giving centers a couple slots a month, meaning like one or two, at most three or four. And so how do you, how do you sort of take into account everybody that qualifies for these treatments, everyone where we think it would benefit them, and how do you sort of plan in order, you know, what happens when, what treatments we can use in between until then um, is, is a big part of what we do. Um, as I said, the sort of logistics of this, of how do you, how do you have people stay close to a center, um, you know, staying one hour away in New York City doesn't mean you actually go that far versus if you're in the suburbs and you're at a center that's, you know, not in the middle of a city, staying one hour away, you might be actually kind of really far away at that point. And so how that's very different, um, the access to these products, you know, the approvals are different in every country. Um, even within the U.S., they're only available at certain, you know, centers, most often bigger academic centers, places that already do transplant. Um, because of the risks and the potential risks that can get, you know, very significant in terms of the side effects, 
being able to have good ICU level care and having the doctors around that focus on that, that understand how the CAR T cells work as well and can work in conjunction, um, you know, with the with the CAR T cell teams, um, you know, is really important in terms of having uh, that set up in advance. Um, and so which treatment is right is not always the question. Often we have to change the question to which treatment is right when. We know that the transplants are very effective. Melphalan is a great, very active drug for myeloma and has been for 40 years. Um, it's not as expensive, obviously. There's no manufacturing concerns. It's available everywhere. The risks uh, of getting that type of transplant are very small in terms of infections. And we've been using it for 40 years. We, we know the safety of that. Versus the CAR T cells and the bispecific antibodies, um, the data is very early. We don't have people that are five and 10 years out from a CAR T cell or a bispecific antibody, even of the first clinical trials yet. And so, um, you know, that as we sort of learn more from that, as we work out, you know, can we get more slots available? Can we work on, um, you know, can we, can we get more and more people to be able to be treated in a shorter amount of time? Can we make it so that people don't have to wait six weeks in between and, you know, potentially have patients that progress and so they can't even get to their treatment even though that we tried to get the cells out? And so all of that is sort of things that we take into account as we're sort of planning um, the different treatments and, and the order. And so that's why most likely along the case of time from the time of diagnosis for a patient with myeloma, multiple of these will come up and it's just a question of, you know, which order um, and how best to sort of use each one to get the longest amount of time where we're able to control the disease. So I'll stop there, um, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, for your excellent presentation. Um, I'll now begin the, the question and answer session. If you have a question for Dr. Shaw, please use the chat box on the left side of the screen to submit your question. and. We'll answer as many questions as possible. Um, the first question, Dr. Shaw, is how long will my immune system be compromised following CAR T cell therapy? So that's a very good question. Um, there's a few different levels to that answer. So there is that short-term side um, where um, when we look at the infections that are there, um, there's the very short-term part where when your blood counts are low, you're at much higher risk of certain infections. In the later inf um, infections, we actually follow um, immune system markers, so CD4 counts, um, CD19 counts, so blood work that we can measure how active and how many of those immune cells have come back. And so there are some prevention medicines that people will be on for at least six to nine months, even 12 months, and it really depends, and we check those numbers every couple months. Um, usually every three months or so once you've gotten past the first couple months um, in order to be able to decide when it's okay to stop the prevention medicines and that that risk goes down. Thank you. This next question is somewhat related. Can you share the thresholds for each vital that I should be watching that are markers for immunosuppression? So the easiest way to sort of think about that is the first of these is the neutrophil count to come back up. So the bacterial prevention usually stops once your neutrophil count is above one. Um, the immune system numbers that we watch in the later one, as I mentioned, are the sort of CD19 count. And so that one, we usually want the immune system uh, or the, that CD19 count, to, uh, sorry, the CD4 count. Um, to be above 200 on at least two checks, so meaning it's staying stably high enough, um, and that's when we would stop some of the other prevention medicines. Thank you. You mentioned two FDA-approved CAR-T for multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma. Are there more in clinical trials, and does insurance only cover those that are FDA-approved? Um, so there are many, many more in clinical trials, uh, depending on where in the world you're sort of looking at the trials. Um, even within the United States, there are several others that are for both the same target of the BCMA. There are some for other targets. Uh, you'll see something about GPRC5D, so just sort of different proteins on the outside of the myeloma cells. 
the uh, insurance covers completely for the product itself, the FDA approved CAR T cells. Um, for clinical trials, it's really insurance specific, but most of the time what happens is that the product itself that's being investigated is covered by the clinical trial, as is any research blood work or procedures, but the standard of care things, the chemotherapy part, the taking care of you part, all of that is still covered by your insurance. And so we still would have to get approval for everything except for the part that's actually being studied. Thank you. Um, is CAR T cell therapy a second choice after an autologous stem cell transplant for patients with myeloma or, per, or perhaps the first, what would be the determining factor as to which would be better? Right, so, so at the moment, because both um, products require patients to have had at least four lines of treatment, most patients will have, unless they're very old, have, will have uh, or have very significant you know comorbidities or things that prevented them most people who are getting a CAR T cell will have already had at least one autologous transplant so one you know time with melphalan before they're getting to a CAR T cell there are more and more clinical trials that are trying to move it up to do it earlier in treatments and and so we don't know yet whether we would do this instead of a transplant before a transplant um, I will say that melphalan is still excellent as a treatment for myeloma, and so I think that most likely what will happen um, is even if the CAR T cells move to very early lines of treatment, the transplant will end up just being later on at some point. Um, because right now, even with the CAR T cells, we still don't have a way of saying that the myeloma won't come back and that people are cured. Okay, thank you. We have two questions that are relating to smoldering myeloma. Is CAR-T cell therapy for high-risk smoldering myeloma a viable option? So, um, at the moment, you know, it's not. Um, as you saw, you know, right now it's still being studied in much later lines of myeloma treatment. The big thing I would say with smoldering myeloma to think about is that smoldering myeloma you're, the goal there is is partly to prevent from becoming active myeloma. And so if you are doing a treatment that has a higher risk of side effects and complications, then you do have the risk of transforming to full sort of active myeloma that you would be treating, then it's very much a question of whether we're actually helping anybody by using that treatment earlier. That That a patient who was never going to need treatment, who would have been able to be monitored for several years, but gets a really terrible infection and dies because we did a CAR T cell early, um, you know, that's where the balance sort of is of, of deciding any treatments for smoldering myeloma. Um, and so I think right now we don't have any evidence to say that a CAR T cell is the right treatment for smoldering myeloma. Okay. I am an 81-year-old female. I had CAR T infusion last November. At what point can I begin replacing my vaccines, and at what point can I begin assimilating back into my community? So I think there's two parts to that. Um, one is, um, you know, as we said, your doctors are probably monitoring your immune system, and it's great, you know, that you had all of that. You, you were able to, you know, presumably you're doing well as you're, you know, on here and asking us questions, and that's great. Um, I would say, you know, it partly depends, you know, we're very careful in terms of infection. So I think as long as, um, you know, you're being careful, the rates of COVID in your community are much lower, you're, you know, if you're inside places, you know, potentially still wearing a mask um, and trying to avoid people who are actively sick, you know, you can probably start to integrate more, um, you know, into, into the society. I mean, I, I, again, would have to defer directly based on your numbers to your doctor, but that's where I would say. In terms of the vaccine part of it, um, we've mostly been doing, uh, repeating the COVID vaccines from about six months. Um, again, some of this can, you know, depend on how well you'll respond will depend on your B cell count, so the CD19 numbers when they check your immune function. Um, there are T cell responses as well, so again, depends on how much of that CD4 count you, you do have. Um, but the rest of the vaccines in terms of, um, pneumonia and polio and things like that, 
what we mostly do is actually check the titers of those vaccines um, because you don't lose all of them the way that you do with the transplant. And so what we would say is replace the ones that are have gone down. Um, oftentimes that's going to be the pneumonia vaccines more than anything else. Thank you. The next person says that he had a Beckma infusion late August in 2022 and heavy load at start. He responded well, but only lasted two months. He was non-secretory and then came back secretory. How does disease load play into response and duration? Yeah, and that's a very good question, and we don't really have um, the best answers right now. That's sort of where a lot of the research is of trying to figure out, um, you know, for how much disease you go in with, you know, most people um, are already not responding to many other treatments. So for us to just be like, oh, let's try to give something more before we start this is often not really feasible or realistic. Um, we do, to a degree, you know, it's always harder the more myeloma that's there. Um, but that being said, you know, there have been, um, you know, patients that respond um, really well. And how long it lasts for is the other part that's, that's very difficult to predict beforehand. Um, so I think those are really active areas where people are trying to figure out those answers. Thank you. This next person asks, with bite, B-I-T-E, how is it fairly compared for CAR-T therapy with efficacy, duration, and remission? Yeah, so one of the, let me see if I can go back to this. So the currently approved bite is the um, which is also for, uh, you know, BCMA. This, again, here it's also still very hard to compare um, because people have often had a CAR T cell before they've had the ticlistamam. Um, what I would say is mostly um, the big differences here are that the CAR T cells are sort of a one and done treatment, that you, you do them the one time, um, it works or it doesn't work. Um, the the bispecifics, unfortunately, at the moment are mostly the approved one is weekly, sort of indefinitely. Um, and so that makes a big difference in terms of, um, you know, how much you're still having to be in the clinic. And, you know, uh, obviously, as long as things are working, that's great. But there, you know, there, there's some side effects to that as well in terms of um, in the CAR T cells, you know, you expect your immune system to recover because you've had the treatment once and then it starts to eventually recover again. Versus in the bispecifics, it's sort of a continuous thing where your immune system is low, um, because of that. That being said, it's much easier uh, in terms of slots and availability and things like that to get a bispecific because you're not waiting for the manufacturing component, that it's more of a drug that has to be given. Um, and so, uh, you know, there, that's really the big difference right now is, is the one and done versus sort of continuous treatment. Um, response waves wise, they've actually been relatively similar so far. Um, and so we think that all of these are appropriate and effective treatments, and, and a lot of it is which one can you get where you are. Thank you. I have one more bag of my stem cells left from the initial collection from 2014. Can that bag of cells be used for the CAR T cell therapy? It's a very good question, and the answer is not directly. So it's not like we could take those frozen cells, send them to a company, and say, hey, here, you know, we want, we want CAR T cells. Those cells that you have stored are, are stem cells, which are baby cells that can grow into your healthy blood and immune cells. And so the way that you would be able to use those, and what, there's sort of two ways. One, and we have a clinical trial where we're doing this right now, is that for people who have a lot of active myeloma, we do a second, third, whatever number sort of, but we do another auto transplant. We use those cells that you have stored from the beginning. And at between three and six months afterwards, you now have new T cells that are not exhausted, that haven't seen all the treatments that people have seen in between. Um, and those T cells are then extracted and made into CAR T cells with presumably, and this is what we're studying, you know, because they're less exhausted, you know, do they work better? So that's one, one way you can sort of do it. 
The other way that those cells that are in the freezer have been used is that sometimes after the CAR T cell treatment, while we'd like and we you know have on the graphs and everything where your blood counts go down and by a month they're coming back up, there are some times where we have pro uh, you know longer times, you know weeks, months where the blood counts are still staying very low. And oftentimes, what's actually works uh, for people that have myeloma that for the people that lymphoma don't have this benefit is because of having those extra cells in the freezer. We don't give more chemotherapy, but we can just put those cells in, and those baby cells will go and grow and help to recover the blood counts afterwards. So there's still a benefit to having those extra cells in the freezer. Thank you. Great comprehensive answer. The next question is, does the CAR T therapy that targets multiple myeloma differ much than a therapy like Axacel for lymphomas? The main difference is the, the target itself, that on the, the lymphoma cars, the target is the CD19, and in the myeloma cars, the target is the BCMA. The logistics of how we make it into a CAR T cell, how it gets infused, the side effects that we're looking for, uh, the monitoring, all of that is pretty similar. Um, the risk of the side effects, so the rate of people that's going to have cytokine release syndrome and neurologic toxicities, those are a little bit different, but the actual process part is very similar. Thank you. The next question is, you've touched upon it because they wanted to know about the expected side effects of CAR-T. They also are asking which drug has the best result or the fewest side effects would that um, come into play in your decision what to make, uh, what, which, which drug to use? Yeah, so we don't we don't know at the moment of the two approved CAR T cells, you know, which is better. We would love to sort of have that answer, uh, but we don't know. What we what we know is they both work uh, and they both work well. And so because of the manufacturing issues and the availability and certain sites are only approved for one versus the other, um, at the moment what we basically say is whichever one we can get and get in the right time frame that works for being able to treat um, someone in terms of how we can actually think to get to the, you know, to the cells, um, that's the product that we use. Thank you. And then my last question that I've got here is, I am a spouse of a person who is a candidate for CAR T cell therapy for multiple myeloma, and I am wondering what are the differences or will be the differences in caring for somebody going through CAR T versus an autologous stem cell transplant? Yeah, so that's a really good question too. The the um, there's sort of um, short term differences uh, and a little bit of a long term difference. So the short term differences uh, part of it is very similar. The the job of the caregiver is making sure the person is eating and drinking enough, making sure they're taking all of their medications. Um, that if they get a fever, if they you know if they don't feel well, that you're calling and going back to you know the wherever, uh, you know, the treatment, the center. Um, the big difference here, especially early in those first couple weeks, is looking out for that cytokine release syndrome and neurologic toxicities. And because besides the, on the autologous transplant side, you're mostly looking for infection, but on this side, you're really looking for those other side effects. And so if all of a sudden, you know, they have, you know, more of a headache, they have trouble speaking, they can't get their words out, that those mean something in this. And so that's really the biggest difference here in terms of being the caregiver, is watching out for all of a sudden they don't make sense when they're talking to you. Um, the uh, In the later time points, um, most of the time, because the chemotherapy is sort of lighter here, that, that recovery in terms of energy and appetite and stamina and blood counts is uh, happens in a shorter time frame than it does with the auto transplant. And so we do, you know, expect people um, the potential to go back to work or the potential to do more activity um, usually is even by that 30-day mark versus with the auto transplant, it may be two or three months before they really feel um, totally back to normal, you know, energy-wise. So I think it's it's partly um, timing of fatigue and energy uh, that's really a bigger difference uh, later on. Very good. Thank you. 
And I'll be closing the session now. That was our last question. And on behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Shah for a very helpful presentation. And thank you, audience, for your excellent questions. Please contact BMT InfoNet if we can help you in any way. And enjoy the rest of the symposium. <laughs>